So we're in Romans 3 because there's this verse that's been, um, that I was, that I've been thinking about a lot, and that's what you get today. Um, because I've been, think, I've been memorizing these verses that have the word whatever in them, because the Bible has a lot to say about whatever. Am I right? Right, it does. Um, so one of my whatever verses is in Romans chapter 3, and actually the reason I, I came back to this is not only have I been thinking about it a lot, but I was going to throw it in at the end of last week's sermon, and last week's sermon was going long, and so I, I didn't talk about it, but I wanted to, and so I thought, well, good, let's, let's do this. And it, it led me to this question that I've, been, that I've actually been thinking about for many, many years. And I always, I always hesitate to say, do you guys ever ask yourself this question? Because usually when I do that, people just stare at me like, no, I've never asked myself that question. But this one, I think I'm almost certain you've asked yourself this question. And, and, and I think about this a lot. Um, and maybe I'm just more messed up than you guys are. That's highly possible. What if starting tomorrow there were no devil? Um, would I still be as big a mess as I am next week? I think about that all the time. I don't know why, but I do. Um, like if, if, if tomorrow morning you woke up and the headline was, <laughs> devil sent to prison, and you didn't have to deal with him, or none of his, none of his demons, none of that, um, would, I, would I still be a mess? Would temptation still be the same? right? Because in the Bible, there are many, any number of places, particularly in James, where it talks about this kind of unholy trinity of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the world and the devil, kind of, in Ephesians, he's called the prince of this world, and, and these world systems that are all put together, and, and, and the flesh is, the, is the, this something inside of us that opens up the door and says, sure, dude, come on in. Let's do this, right? And so we're bent kind of this way, but, but how would it work if you took one of those away? Um, and in Revelation, there are many, many people who believe that we're going to see that happen, that there's going to be this period called the millennium, and it's going to say the devil is bound for a thousand years, and, we'll gr- and there's going to be people there who are going to have babies, and they're going to have sinful nature, while people, some people don't have a sinful nature, and we're going to get to see what happens with people who have the flesh, who don't have the devil, and that's kind of one way of looking at it, and there's going to end up going to be another war, and I don't want to give Revelation away, but that's going to, that's going to happen if you haven't read it. A spoiler, yeah. Um, but here's, here's why I think I would still be a mess, because in Galatians five and six, where Paul talks about this, this battle that takes place, um, there's two teams, and there's two, two people, whatever they are, two teammates on each team. Um, it's spirit and faith versus flesh and law. Now, aren't those strange teammates? Like, like spirit and faith we get, but flesh and law? Like, shouldn't it be flesh and devil? Like, if it's spirit, shouldn't it be, shouldn't it be something like that? Why did, fa- why did flesh get law? Right, and last week we talked about the devil as the accuser, as the deceiver. Right, well, where's accusation going to come from? Well, I think maybe that would still happen with flesh and law working together. Right, because what we see in our text is that law and flesh um, will take me to some very bad places. You read Galatians and look at the list. There's, there's the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But then there's the fruit of the, fruit, fruit of the, fre- fruit of the flesh, and it's a really bad list. It's nothing like love, joy, peace, and patience, right? It's like adultery and murder and all this other stuff. Um, and the devil's not in the list, right? Um, so in other words, you take my flesh and I'm already a mess and stick me in a world where the devil's at work, rough stuff, right? 
But, but one of the things the law and the flesh do when they're working together is that they create this kind of self-sufficiency and the law lies to us. And the law will, will do one of two things. The law will either say, there is no way you can do this, you are condemned. Or the law will say, man, you're really good at this, keep it up. It just all depends on you. But let's, let's take this apart because last week we talked about answering the accuser. Today I want to talk about answering the law. When whatever the law says, the law says whatever it says. Now, quick Bible survey. I hope this is quick. But let's just go back as far as Exodus because that's where we first hear these words. Um, if you go to Exodus 19 and 20, right, they, and, and you get Mount Sinai, you get the Ten Commandments, it's all there. Um, but, but when you go into Exodus 19, you have God describing these Israelites who've been brought out of slavery in Egypt, right? They've come out, the, the, the Passover lambs happened, the, the Red Sea, the Egyptians squished, they're out now. And, he, and he's calling these, thing, these, these Israelites, he's, he's calling them things like, you are my people. You are my treasured possession. You are a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. And he's calling them these things before he has given them the law. It's so important to know. He's, he's already saying, I've redeemed you out of slavery. You're my own. You're my people. And then you get to chapter 20, and the Ten Commandments come, and it all starts with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So in other words, I'm giving the law to a people I've already redeemed. I'm giving the law to a people who are already my precious possession. Let's ponder this for just a second. I don't want to get too bogged down here, but imagine if the opposite had happened. Imagine if Moses had left the burning bush with the law and had gone to Egypt to these enslaved Israelites and said this, okay, God gave me this law and he told me to tell you that if you'll keep all of this, he'll let you go. I'm sure they would have said, well, sign me up because our lives are just peachy keen and easy here, building pyramids and whatnot. Yeah, let's get some law. And, and maybe if we're good enough, you know, there's only a million of us so if we can just kind of get everybody on the same page, being good law keepers, how long? That can't take too long, right? I mean, no, that's not how it worked. It was death is coming. You're going to kill this lamb, and its blood's going to be there, and that's all it's going to take. It's not your blood. It's the lamb's blood, and you're going to be my treasured people. Now, here's the law. So in other words, the law is given to a redeemed people so that the world can see what a treasured nation looks like to God's glory. And you get to Deuteronomy, and he says there's a blessed way and there's a cursed way. <laughs> you choose the blessed way of obedience where you love me and you trust me and you allow me to work on your behalf and I bring you into this land and you obey the law and you let me put you together as my people around this law, and it's going to go well. But if you don't, it's going to go badly. And your rabbi will tell you, 613 commands found. 613 commands. And by Jesus' time, oh yeah, Moses also said, it's probably going to go badly. Human nature. So it goes badly, you, you get, oh, just read the prophets, you know how it goes, right? A bunch of them, the Assyrians attack, take away, the Babylonians attack, take away, it's just wiped out, it's ugly, and you get, this, they come back, and it's like, we've got to do it right this time. And so they're like, okay, how are we going to do it right? Okay, well, let's, we'll do this. Let's take the laws and we'll build a fence around it and then we'll build a fence around the fence, and then we'll build a fence around that fence, and we'll build a fence around that fence, so that there'll be a fence around the fence, around the fence, around the fence, around that law, so that nobody will break the law. In particular, how about the Sabbath? 
Don't break the Sabbath. Okay, I know what that means. Do not stick a needle through a piece of cloth. That's got to be working, right? It's like 300 and something laws just on the Sabbath, right? And it's just the laws get more and more and more tedious and burdensome. And by Jesus' time, there's just, there's just laws on top of laws on top of laws. And then like watchdogs making sure you're keeping the laws and people are just weighed down with them. Until Jesus says a couple of things. Um, he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, you guys think that you guys think that man was made for laws. And you forgot that, that God made these for you, for your benefit. And instead, you've just made people into law-making machi- law-keeping machines. That's not what this is about. And besides, I've came to fulfill the law. The end is here. And so Paul will say later, Christ is the, the end of the law for righteousness. So he dies. He's the Passover lamb. He fulfills the priestly and the sacrifice. All that stuff happens. We can't go too far there. But, but, but let's just go to the early church. Let's get to Romans. Because Romans does two things. It, and and we, we love what Romans does theologically, but we forget what Romans does practically. Theologically, um, we've got to figure out how this is going to work with law and gospel and grace. We've got to figure out how exactly are we righteous again? Right, it's almost like Paul writes like a, like a lawyer, um, putting it all together, right? Well, this is how the Gentiles are sinners, and this is how the Jews are sinners. This is how people without the law are sinners. This, this is how people with the law are sinners, right? And this is, how, um, this is how everybody looks up at the sky and says, whoa, that's amazing. There must be a creator out here. Now I'm going to make something with my own hands and worship it. Right, because we suppress the truth in our own unrighteousness. And this is how people become lawbreakers. And he gets by the end of Romans chapter 2, and he's like, God doesn't show favorites. Romans chapter 2, 11. God doesn't show favorites. If you sin apart from the law, you die. If you sin with the law, you get judged by the law. Because it's not about who hears the law that's righteous, it's about those who obey it. And when a Gentile does what the law prescribes, even though he doesn't have the law, it just means that I've written something called conscience inside of you, but you're not even keeping that. So he says there's a day that's going to come when God is going to judge all the secrets for people with the law and people without the law. So those of you who brag about being such good law keepers, you dishonor God by breaking the law. So, but there's a practical side to this, and I want you to try, this is what I want you to try to grasp this morning. Imagine uh, it's for the first century church, okay? Now, we talk about new believers in the church. You understand in the first century church at this time, everybody's a new believer, Right? <laughs> We're all new believers here. So let's imagine that's kind of how it works. I mean, maybe by this time, 20 years, 30 years, maybe. Right? But pretty much everybody's a new believer. But let's, let's just put a line right here, and let's say that on this side of the church, we have all Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. And on this side, we have all Gentile believers in Jesus Christ. I didn't tell anybody that you were going to be a Gentile. I told my wife. She was sitting on the Gentile side this morning. You guys are on the Jewish side this morning. Let's imagine... Um, you grew up in a home where you traveled to Jerusalem for the feast. So imagine you grew up in a home where you didn't do anything on the Sabbath. So imagine you grew up in a home where you repeated the Torah, where you memorized the verses from Moses, where you knew the prophets and you knew the law and you knew the Psalms and you knew the history and you knew all the stories and you knew what to do and what not to do. And you knew Abraham. And you knew how special it was to be in that chosen treasured people. And you knew all of that. And sitting right across the aisle from you was a group of people who knew none of that. None of it. As a matter of fact, they had spent their lives either doing nothing or worshiping idols. They may have had idols in their homes. They may have just been absolute pagans. And now here you all are 
believing in the same Jesus Christ as Savior, but you guys are over here going, well, yeah, but he's actually our Savior. <laughs> he is Jewish, you know, right? <laughs> and, and what you guys are thinking is, well, those people need to become Jews. This is the whole thing. So they need to circumcise all their boys and all the adult men. You need to be circumcised too. And, you know, church membership is rough. What can we say? And, and so you've got to become Jews. And there's this whole argument happening. And then imagine just one brave Jewish family over here decides, okay, this Sunday after church, we're inviting a Gentile family over for lunch. They don't know about hand washing and the, how to use the dishes. and They don't know none of this unclean, clean stuff. They don't know none of this. It's embarrassing. and They don't know what to do, and it's just uncomfortable, right? And this side, frankly, just feels holier. <laughs> and Paul is trying to say, how in the world are we going to move forward from here with this kind of line drawn in the church. And he starts by saying, well, let's be clear, you're both sinners. <laughs> in your own way, in your own unique way. Yeah. Because a Jew isn't just what you are on the outside. You have your heart circumcised by the Spirit. It's not just written code. Okay, so then there's these accusations that start flying. And some of them are kind of funny. They're at the beginning of chapter 3. I'll just fly through them. Oh, yeah, then, then what advantage is there to being a Jew over here? You're going, maybe you're saying, well, what, what, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Oh, oh, wait, no, wait a minute. Let's not throw out being a Jew, right? We'll get to 9, 10, and 11 maybe someday. That's in the future. But it's all there, right? But they're the ones entrusted with the very words of God. You guys should be thankful that you've got these people, <laughs> And then somebody says, well, 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 wait a minute. What if some didn't even have faith? Would that, would that kind of nullify God being faithful? Like, what if, what if everybody just stopped believing? What would happen? And Paul says, no, 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 no. Everybody can be a liar. God would still be true. And then somebody comes up with this objection, which is, this one's my favorite. Okay. But what if my unrighteousness makes God's righteousness look that much better? What if I'm a liar and it got, makes God's truthfulness really shine? Like what if the worse I am, the better God looks? Who is he to make judge me? I was just making him look good. <laughs> and Paul just has this nice little concise um, their condemnation is deserved. <laughs> That's not going to play. Yeah. And then one last one. Well, while we conclude, are we any better? Not at all. We've already said this. Jews and Gentiles alike, all are under sin. No one is righteous. No one, one. No one understands. No one seeks God. Everyone is a sinner. So then we come to verse 19. This is where we want to jump in late, but let's jump in. Here's our Whatever. Now we know. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So, the people on this side, sorry, I keep pointing over here, they're saying, what about this law? He says, whatever law. That's for people under the law. Well, what about this law? That's for people under the law, too. And Well, I was over at this Jew's house. What about this law? That's for people under the law. Well, yeah, but this, under the law. What, did, under the law. Whatever law you're going to come up with, it's for people under the law. Why? So that every mouth may be silenced. Or as he says later, 
so that no one can boast. So that no one can say, here's my law-keeping track record. When the law comes, everybody has to shut up. And everybody is accountable. Boy, that's a horrible double-edged sword, isn't it? (laughs) The law comes, and nobody's kept it, so everybody's silenced. But guess what? Everybody's accountable. And no one is declared righteous by observing the law, because what does the law do? It just makes you conscious of sin. And this is Paul writing this. This is a man who says, when he's giving like his resume in Philippians, I was born in this family, born in this tribe, da, da, da. and then he says, and according to the law, I was blameless. <laughs> Pharisee, if man, I was the man. I was trained in the best schools. I, I was blameless when it came to the law. As far as he knew, he was a good law keeper. And then he says, and then one day this whole thing about you shall not covet came along. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. What does that... And the whole thing comes tumbling down. Just one little law. And then he realizes, he meets Jesus, and he's like, I'm the worst sinner on the planet. <laughs> and he says, so, I just, my mouth is silenced. I'm, like, I'm accountable to God. I can't observe the law and ever be righteous in front of him. What am I going to do? Because the law just tells me I'm conscious of sin. It's like a thermometer. The doctor just keeps sticking it in my mouth, and it keeps coming out 104. And it's not making me any better. Hey, doctor, can we get some medicine out of that thermometer? No, we can't. Verse 21, good news. But now, oh, is there something else? But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, and this is so funny, look at this, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Did you catch that? Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, you're accountable, you're, you, but, but, but the law does tell you one thing. There is another righteousness. There is another way, and the law even says, apart from me, the law says, that there's, there's a way to be righteous. Yeah, you're accountable, but there's another way. And here's the other way. And it says made known, not figured out. This way has been made now, and it's been revealed. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Paul. Isn't that a little easy? (laughs) I mean, I worked hard for what I got. Nope. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, you think you worked hard for what you got, but you're just still falling short of the glory of God. But there's a righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, how does that work? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely, justified meaning made right, made righteous, given righteous freely by grace, as if, as if saying freely wasn't enough. He says, by grace. Through the redemption, there's the word from Exodus, I redeemed you out of slavery, that came by Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ has done something that will allow you to receive what the law could never give you. The law just keeps shutting you up The law says you're not righteous, you're not righteous, you're not rightness, and you're like working, working, working. And Jesus comes along and says, let me give you something. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That is a propitiation. There's our word from way back in 1 John for those of you who are around. And this is the interesting thing here. When he said propitiation... Do you know what side of the audience would have been most familiar with that? This side. And this side. But guess what? They would have entirely different ideas about what that word meant. Because these people had been to places where they worshipped idols or they worshipped the gods. And you know what you have to do to gods? 
you got to appease them. you got to propitiate them because you want your crops to go well or you want to get the girl or you want to do this, 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 or this. So you offer an offering to the gods and you hope that you have made them happy and you've appeased them and you'll get whatever it was you wanted. Are you propitiated? And these people over here are going, no, 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 no. That's, that's temple talk. This is mercy seat talk. This is where the blood goes of the sacrifice. This is, where, this is big deal stuff. This is priest. This is sprinkling. This is, whoa, are you kidding me? Jesus became that? What? So do you see what Paul has done here? Paul has said, you're all guilty by the law, but let me bring you together with a word. Propitiation. And it's not what you think it means, right? It's not you trying to appease God, and it's the end of that law. Because look who does the presenting. It's not something we do to appease God. God presents him. God gives the sacrifice, and it's us through faith in his blood. And it demonstrates that he is just because the punishment for lawbreaking lands on Jesus. So do you see what he does? It says, so that he can be just and justify those who have faith in Jesus. How in the world is he going to justify somebody who isn't keeping the rules? You can't do that. Every teacher knows that. Every judge knows that. Everybody knows that. You can't just be letting lawbreakers run off free. You can't do that. What kind of judge does that? How can you be just and justify a lawbreaker unless someone has come in, come in, kept the law, fulfilled the law, gave their blood for the law in your place, then you trust them because the law keeps silencing you. But Jesus comes and says, here, have this, have this. And so the Gentiles are saying, oh, so it's not me down here saying, I hope this appeases you. It's the holy God saying, no, I'm, to, I'm taking this from my end of things. I'm doing the heavy lifting. And then it's the Jews over here saying, hearing, oh. So that's how Jesus takes care of all that entire temple whole thing there. And Paul says, yeah, just wait around for Hebrews, right? That whole thing. So, Here's, here's what I want to get back to and tie it back to last week. Um, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So if the law, if you find yourself in a place, well, let me back up a minute. Um, because I think there's a temptation here and then, Boy, this is going to be difficult. I'm, I'm, I, I'll tread lightly here because, okay. There is a temptation when you reach my age and beyond. Um, I'll start with me. 54 is the cutoff. So anybody before me does not face the temptation. Everybody after me does. Um, right? You've, right? You've been doing this for a little bit, Right? So let's just imagine the people on this side are all my age and older and all the, everybody over here is not. You guys are, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Some of you are like, not even close. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but let's imagine you're just seasoned and mature and this long walk with Jesus Christ under your belt and just lots of love and lots of obedience in your history, right? And your tendency is going to be to come to the younger person and, and they're like, okay, well, and you're going to look back through your history and you're going to go, well, I did this, 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 and this. Now you go do those things. And you can be like me. 
<laughs> oh, and there's 10 of them. Oh, didn't mean, to, right. You know what, you see what I'm saying? I, I, I do this. I do this. So I'm not, I'm not knocking anybody because I do this, right? Oh, well, I started out, I was in this group and we did this, this, and this. Oh, and we did this, this, and this. So just run along and do those things that I did, right? And, and the next thing you know, we've put other people under the law, under the law by which I sanctified myself. <laughs> How in the world did I do that? I mean, I know all along it wasn't that way, but, right, that's, that's one thing. But when you feel the law coming down on you, right, and you just kind of walk under this burden, you kind of walk under this sense of condemnation, um, you just feel the law weighing on you. This, this whole thing of I'm not measuring up, I'm not acceptable, I'm not good enough, I'm not righteous enough, I'm not meeting the standards, I'm not churchy enough, I'm not Christian-y enough, I don't have enough faith, I'm not, just not enough this, 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 and this. I just want to just tell you, get out from under there. Because whatever the law is saying, it's saying it to people who are under the law. So, so if you want to let the law do its job, you can say, okay, you've done your job now, and then you just go, okay, now Jesus, you do your job. Because I'm not under law, I'm under grace. And there's no condemnation anymore. And so like the, like the Israelites didn't keep the law to get through the Red Sea and get out of slavery, right? I'm not keeping the law to be accepted. And I'm telling you, there, there are people in this room I know who worked all your lives in a home where acceptance was given out like in an eyedropper, right? Like in thimblefuls of acceptance. If you were like, had a really good month, you got a thimble of acceptance, Right? And so you, you even take into adulthood this idea, I'm going to work for acceptance, and it's very, very hard to get to the place where you work from acceptance, where you, where you approach life from, I am accepted in Jesus Christ. He has been the propitiation for my sins. The law comes along and weighs you down, and you say, no, 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 no. I'm not under there anymore. <laughs> I'm not under that. So whatever it is you're saying, go to somebody that's under that, because I'm not under there anymore. I'm under grace. I'm under Jesus. So, can I just tell you, those of you who are like that, Jesus does not hand his acceptance out in in an eyedropper thimble thingy. He, like, gives it out in 50-gallon drums. And he'll just, like, if the first one, he'll just give another one, right? I don't know why this keeps happening, but I can tell you I know when it's happening in my own heart is when I see myself kind of being legalish with younger people. Or, um, here's another one. Um, Post-temptation. Like, you give in to temptation, and you know what you do? You offer a propitiation. (laughs) Okay, Lord, I know I failed. So here's three things I'm going to do to appease you. It'll be better next time. I hope you're satisfied, right? And we we have these great, beautiful things in life, these practices, these disciplines, these habits. And I see this shift in my own heart. I have to pay very, very, very close attention to this. I bet you do too. (coughs) These disciplines that are a place where I go to get grace, a place where I go to fellowship with Jesus, the place where I go where the life of the vine flows into this branch, the place where I go for gratitude and worship, the place where I go to to know love can very easily slip into the place where I go to get approval and acceptance. And the next thing you know, I'm under the law. So then what happens if you miss two days of that law I'm condemned. My mouth is shut. I missed two days. What have I done? (laughs) 
right? Let Jesus do his work. The law will say, you're doing such a good job at a law keeper, especially those people on the other side. They're horrible at this. But man, you're good. You just say, shut up, law. I'm not under you. I'm under Jesus. And then the law says, you're awful at this. What are you doing? You say, law, I'm not under you. And then you can even say, to which the law and the prophets testify. You can say, law, thank you for pointing me to Jesus. He fulfilled you (laughs) for me and bled and died for me. I'm under him now. So the law does its job. It takes you to Jesus. So I just want to encourage you today. Just look for the warning signs. I have to look for the warning signs in me all the time where I'm, I'm taking the habits or the disciplines or whatever they are that, that take me to worship and I turn them into laws that I use for acceptance. Or I take those things and I place them on other people and I make them laws by which they are acceptable. Or I just get into a place of comparison. Or I get into a place where I try to appease my way back into fellowship with Jesus. I don't know what your warning signs are. Those are my warning signs that I am slowly getting back under the law for righteousness. I have to get back out from under that and say, sorry, I'm not under you. I'm under Jesus. Because working from acceptance is a very, very different deal than working for acceptance acceptance. Will you pray with me? Lord, um, goodness, we live in a world with the devil in it. My goodness. And so our flesh loves the law. Our flesh loves to try to measure up and condemn. And the devil would gladly let us have this way. And we live in a world, Lord, where comparison is at every hand. God, with... uh, was, was it ever so easy to compare ourselves to someone else? And the law will gladly let us do it. The world, the flesh, and the devil will gladly let us do it. Thank you for the acceptance, the righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh Lord Jesus, for shedding your blood, for being that propitiation. And Lord, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters in this room who just fall in love with the gospel a little more all the time. God, may this be one of those mornings. And God, if there's just people here who, who are just starved for acceptance and approval, may they feel it today from you. May they feel loved and approved by you, God. And then I pray that they would be the kind of people who lavish that grace on others. Lord, wouldn't it be amazing if the gospel did this kind of work in this church and then in churches all across our community and our state, Lord? If instead of being the kind of people who heap condemnation and law on others and put other people under the law, wouldn't it be amazing if we were a people who understood and saw the propitiation of Jesus Christ so clearly and so lavish that we were just free to love and share the gospel with others. That there were no measuring up in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would worship and that we would serve And that we would love like a loved people. That we would accept like an accepted people. That we would give grace like a graced people. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that those habits, those disciplines would become places where we meet with the one who loves us and who loves our souls.
Christ's name we pray.